All right, hello everyone. This is Mocha Product Manager Martin Brennan, and today we're going to talk about the insert module in Mocha Pro. Now, the insert module is an interesting one in our Mocha Pro feature set, and probably one of them that's actually my favorite next to the remove module because of the diversity of tools that it has. So, we're going to dive in a little bit and talk about the manipulation tools and the corner pinning tools, but also just some of the interesting things you can do that you may not have thought of before. So we're gonna switch over right now to our screen. Now I'm gonna be working inside Nuke today. So, but what we're doing inside the insert module, this works for every application. So you don't need to worry too much about the host or if you're using the standalone, most of the stuff we're talking about is going to be working directly inside that insert module. So the biggest difference here is obviously that when you're working with Nuke or Fusion, you're going to have nodes feeding into the inserts, whereas with things like After Effects and Premiere and thing, uh, HitFilm, things like that, you'll be actually bringing it in as a layer instead. So that's the only thing you really need to remember with those hosts is that the insert is a node in some hosts and the insert is a layer in others. Oh yes, I know Michael, never know any love for flame. Michael's just saying he wants to see some more flame love. We'll get some flame love on the channel soon, I hope, Michael. So <laughs> we're going to start by launching the Mocha and just talk a little bit about the insert module. So this is your kind of standard setup. An insert module historically has been used a lot for things like screen inserts, for banners, for signs, for number plate replacement, all those kind of things. And it's expanded quite a bit over the years to do more manipulation. So everyone would be used to this classic scenario of just inserting a screen and then inserting something into it. And if you're using the standalone, you would just import that clip directly here inside the insert clip. Or if you're using the plugin, you can just use the handy insert layer that we were just talking about before. So if I put that in there, We've got our screen that we're pulling in from Nuke. Now, a lot of people ask about the data export versus the insert export. And this is where we wanted to talk a little bit about why you would use insert in different situations as opposed to using the export track option. Because most people would use this quite religiously. We've got a lot, a lot of data export options. We've got all the After Effects power pin and transform datas. We've got Alembic mesh data. We've got, you know, Flame. There you go, Michael. <laughs> We've got Flame. We've got Final Cut. We've got HitFilm. And obviously the Nuke exports, which is what I'm using today. So you normally would just export out a corner pin to a compositor like Nuke and then use that data inside Nuke to finish the composite. And while we're actually in here, Let's just pop back into Nuke for a second. For those that aren't aware, in 2023, we actually added a new feature to Nuke, which is the data export tab. So now you can actually just generate your data directly inside Nuke without having to export it out from the clipboard. So for those that weren't aware of that, that is there now in 2023, which is a very, very handy tool. But we're going to be talking about the rendering aspects today, which is really, really interesting. So. For those that aren't aware of how the insert module works, it's sitting over here on our insert tab. And what we do is we insert a clip, like so. And this fits into the bounds of our surface. So you can see our surface here. Now, generally, that's all you need to do as a beginning point. So we're rendering directly onto the canvas and you can render directly here as well to create an insert composite. And that's sort of the broad basics of how the insert module works. It's literally just inserting a clip and then it actually just renders to file, which is great. But it does something special here, which is it actually inserts a composite, which is literally compositing the foreground and the background. And it also inserts a cutout, which is the alpha of that insert, which is very, very useful when you're doing different compositing actions in different hosts. Now, again, we're going to keep coming back to this, is that why do we use a render versus data? So in specific situations, so for example, if you're using something like Avid Media Composer, 
they don't actually have the ability to do data manipulations like this. So rendering is really the only thing you've got. So in hosts like that, it's extremely important to be able to render your data manipulations out of the host. For Nuke, it's useful for compositing reasons because you can do single clips like this without having to actually generate the additional data and have yet another piece of puzzle of the nodes inside the host. But we can do extra stuff inside here. So this is obviously just a clean insert at the moment. So we'll look at the main comp section of insert in here. So we've got grid warp, which lets us warp individual parts of the insert. Now, again, you could do this inside your compositor, but this is actually manipulating on the tracking data itself, which is very, very important. So it's actually doing a transformation on top of your original tracking data. So that distortion will happen throughout the shot and match with the existing data. And we're going to get into that a little bit more later when we talk about the power mesh warping. And there's multiple levels here. So we always recommend starting at level one, which is the biggest transformation level. And that gives you a big warpy sort of overall change to the grid warp. And it also lets you manipulate like this. And we're going to talk about this as well in another example of why you would use the insert module. You can change levels, so this is again a smaller level, and you can go all the way up to level four and do smaller manipulations. So, and keep in mind too, is that part of these, these live tutorials things is asking those questions about being able to, what features you want inside this. So if you see something useful in the insert module and you go, I really love that, but I want it to do X, let us know in the comments because we definitely want to keep improving this feature. So we can also do grid points only. So here at the moment, we've got uh, a nice cross section. So if we come in here and we want to manipulate over here, we can just make it a whole grid if we want to. So if you want to be able to see what's going on a little bit better and seeing how the warp is affecting that shot, you can do that like this. So we'll talk about, again, the grid warp a little bit later in another uh, organic example. But for the time being on this screen, we're just talking about the basics here. So let's just turn on the grid warp. I'm gonna leave power mesh warp for now because we're gonna get into that in an organic shot later. But then over here, we've added blend mode. So again, if you're working just to preview your shot and get things working, you can adjust your blend modes here. So the obvious one for screens is screen. So we get all the nice reflections back in. And we do recommend sort of some pre-work whenever you're working with screens. So with screens, if we just turn off this insert for a second, you can see here, we don't have anything on our screen here. We don't have tracking markers. We don't have a green screen. We don't have anything like that. This is actually the best way to shoot your shot when you're actually going to do post VFX on it. Because tracking markers get in the way and they destroy reflections. Green screen actually changes the color, so it means you've got to do some saturation to actually make the, the reflection work properly, or you've got to redo mats. And you don't really need a behind key for a screen like this. So here you can see we've got a guy playing a game, and we've got to actually like just keep those gray reflections in there, because Mocha is extraordinarily good at tracking this kind of stuff. It, we just track the edges, and you can see here, if we look at the mat, I'm just cutting out the main distraction here, which is him moving about and the big reflection of the window in the back. And that's enough to actually clean up this shot. <laughs> you can even see here, we've got a cameraman in the back, which we would have to do a different post effect on. But this is the best way to shoot a screen for insert because it just makes life so much easier in post if you don't have to do all that cleanup. So, <laughs> that's right CS, we just, so CS says you can use silhouette to clean up the camera in the shot unless it's hidden enough. Well that's right, or you could use, so you could paint it out with silhouette, you could use the remove module to just tidy it up by just tracking the background reflection. So there's lots of versatile ways to use the Borofest suite to clean up shots like this. But when you're using these pre-shots, it's just really, really handy to start by just using the screen as it was done because it's the perfect gray level it's the perfect green screen so uh let's just go back to our insert all right so there's our insert i'll turn off our mat so when you're manipulating in here too you want to be able to see the insert cleanly so use your tools up here 
the most common one to use would be the tilde key on your keyboard. This may be different for US or uh, um, European keyboards. I'm using an Australian keyboard, obviously, because I'm in Australia. But uh, the tilde usually turns off this big screen, which just hides all your overlays. So you can make sure everything's looking clean. So we'd like that. Or you can just turn off the layers. The layers is just the splines. So splines turn off and that leaves the surface to make it easier to manipulate. And then finally, uh, grid, but we don't have a grid in this, so we'll leave that off. So the other important one to keep on is your zoom window, because zoom window just gives you that extra thing to be able to make sure that your surface is sitting in those corners perfectly. So when you're using the insert module like this, it's much, much easier to refine down and find the existing points. Another good shortcut while you're working with screens and signs and things like this is the command and shift on Mac or control and shift on the Windows and Linux. So when you're holding down those two keys, you get what's called a lazy mover. So when we're dealing with teeny tiny corners and points and things like this, if we're holding down the uh, command or control and the shift key, and dragging, we get a lazy movement, like a sub-pixel movement to make sure we can easily find that corner without going too far. It's a really, really useful shortcut while you're working in the insert module to make sure you're getting those edges. So keep that one in mind, really, really useful. So we've got our opacity two here, so that can adjust I think that this is all just your standard compositing stuff. And then obviously we've got the gain. So gain when you're working with screens, again, is very, very important. So making sure that it actually looks like proper brightness and making sure we pull down the opacity, pulling up the gain, finding the exact levels. So you can do a lot already without having to change anything inside a compositor. You can do it all inside the insert module. So a lot of these things we're talking about today is this philosophy in Mocha of creating data and manipulating it. So this is a thing that we'll come back to again and again, is that Mocha is a data creation tool, but it's also a data manipulation tool. We're not going to focus too much on the heavy compositing tasks, but it makes it much easier to get most of your work done for these shots in these things when you've already done the tracking, you've already done the roto, you can now go ahead and manipulate the screen data to make sure it fits correctly. So the more work you can do in the singular app, the better. Uh, so you're not constantly having to switch between applications. And this is really, really important for things like um, the plugin situation. So plugins, because we have a whole interface for Mocha to make it easy to manipulate data, it means that you can continually have to close and open to go between things when you're working with the data side. When you're inside the insert module, it means you can get most of the work done before you have to go back to your host. So you're wasting less time having to bounce between two things. Now, we would obviously love to put Mocha as just general tools inside the hosts, but that's actually quite complicated for all the different tools we have because it means we've got different APIs, different things that we have to manipulate in the host viewer, and then we have to do that across many, many different types of hosts. So it's much, much simpler to use the core and quite fast tools inside Mocha in the interface and get most of the work done where it's needed the most. So we've also got masks over here. Over on this side, we've got, uh, yeah, using the layers, so that cuts things out, obviously. So if you've got, you know, a soft mask, let's just throw one in over the top here. I'm just going to make this a little bit soft like that. And then we go back to layer one. We can just say, let's go back to the insert module and say, use that light mask. And then we'll get a soft mask from there. So we can go ahead and manipulate this now. And yeah, you'll get a, a nice, so you can do most, again, most of your roto compositing inside the um, insert module as well. And you can invert that as well. So if we go back to here, we can invert to get the opposite. Right, let's just trash that because we don't need that. So another tool in here is the feathering tool. So the feathering tool is very, very good for screens as well because it lets you get that weird fall off that you get on older televisions. 
So the feathering here, if we go to lock and we just adjust a little bit, well, I don't live under it, there it is. Just gonna refresh on a different page. I think we've had an interesting bug there. We'll see if I can figure that out later. But so we can ignore that part. I'm gonna figure out what's going on with that. It seems to not have deleted the mat. I will just get it to clear. There we go. That's better. It was having a little fit there for a second. It was just having a little fit there. <laughs> we'll finish that later. Okay, so the feathering basically feathers in a square edge around the surface. So rather than using the roto, you can actually use the surface edge as an inner feather for your screen. So it means that you can get a soft edge just on the insert itself, so that if you're dealing with uh, older screens where there is like a slight fade off on you know cathode screens and things like that, you can fade in on that edge. So all of this combines together to be a render module inside the host or as rendering to disk. We've also got transform manipulations. So transform manipulations are very useful for when you've set up an existing screen and then you want to manipulate it further outside of the existing tracking data. So you can adjust the position and you can see our little yellow screen happening here. So you can go ahead and adjust positions and rotations and even the shear and perspective outside of the existing um, surface transformation. So it's really useful for making copies of the layer and then repositioning the data afterwards. So, and we can also, once we've actually done that, export it as offset data if we want to. So once you've actually done your little offset manipulations, you can export that data as its own transform, not just the existing tracking data. So that's the kind of the classic way to use the insert module. The insert module is very useful for just doing the straight renders. So let's have a look at that back in the host. I'm gonna save that. So here inside Nuke, we've got our insert connected, and then we can just go ahead and go down to our module renders and click render and choose insert composite. Go back to, there we go, there's our render. So the render is, is rendering here and we've got the uh, reflection coming in already because we've used that blend mode. And you can adjust the blend modes directly in here as well. So if you wanna do multiply instead or any of those, all the blend modes are directly inside the plugin. If you'd prefer to actually do the compositing yourself, you can just go to insert cutout. And insert cutout will just create the cutout, as it says on the tin, and then you can go ahead and do your roto and things. It's very, very clear though that this is specifically taking away all the blends. So it's taking away the blending, it's taking away the masking, it's taking away everything. It's just the manipulations of the surface or the grid warps so that you've got a clean uh, plate to work with, to, to render with. And again, it's quite fast. You've got, it's, it's, it's almost as fast as doing a standard data pin. So it just renders very, very quickly in the scene. And the good thing about this too is, is that if you want to change this, so if I just uh, unplug this insert, for example, and I just read in a different one, let's just grab a random one here. Let's go with this one and feed that in. You can just immediately render a new one. So it's got a lot of versatility in terms of just getting... Yeah, so Michael Landon's asking, do you get a mat too with insert cutout? So with insert cutout, you would use the apply mat functionality. So let's just go back to that. So I'm going to go back to screen here and we'll put in the original clip. So when you're doing insert cutout specifically, you would also use apply mat. So we've got that mat in there. So let's just go and apply mat. So you're not going to see the mat here because we're in, let's go to alpha. 
yeah, so you can see the mat here you know, in Nuke. So the mat is being applied as a separate render operation so that you can keep those as well. But you can also got the versatility of also being able to export um, those mats as data as well. So you've got either the flexibility to render directly to, to disk, rendering to the host, and then also using the mats. So you can apply the mat as a render, which is, can be very useful for soft edges and things like that if you don't want to go ahead and say, for example, if you're in After Effects, we don't export the Purpoint Feathering because they're incompatible. So you could actually apply the mat with all the Purpoint Feathering on top of the cutout and then do all your post compositing like that. So there's a little bit of flexibility in terms of changing the data how you want. And again, this is, comes down to, again, this Mocha philosophy of giving you the data you need and then letting you use it the way you want to. So we've got yeah, render options, data options, and different matting options at the same time. All right, so that's enough of this sort of basic example. Let's have a look at a different example here. I'm just gonna close up this one. And we'll go over to this one. All right, I'm gonna launch up Mocha here. So normally screens are flat. Screens are most of this kind of stuff. So here's a classic example of Times Square. I am not going to go ahead and roto out all of these screens. <laughs> but, uh, so, but this is your classic thing. You've got billboards, you've got screens, you've got different things that you need to change. But what do we do about these kind of screens? So these are curved screens. I mean, you know, monitors are quite curved now. We're starting to get foldable phones. So how do we manipulate a non-flat surface in this particular situation. So I'm gonna cover this area here and we'll talk about it. So I'm gonna start by tracking this. I've already wrote it out this guy's head because he's gonna be in the way. So we can see here, we've just got a very broad garbage mat on him while he's across here. And we're just gonna track this area. So let's go to the end. Uh, yeah, let's start with him covered up, why not? So I'm gonna just draw a very broad shape around my screen. You can see here I'm actually going outside the screen. Whenever you're doing tracking in Mocha, it's usually best to go outside the boundaries of what you're tracking because that gives it a reference point to the background. And I'm just gonna drag this out a little bit here. This is not quite planar, obviously, because it's curving and then you've got this back area, but this will give us a little bit more detail as well and it won't affect the track too much. So I'm gonna drop that below my garbage here, let's just do screen two. I've already tracked this, but I want to show you how we're, we're setting this up. So I've got that. I'm going to grab my surface. And again, we're going to turn on that zoom window. And I'm just going to pull that into the corners here. And you're going to see, obviously, something interesting here is that the corners don't actually fit because we've got this curve. So you can see a massive cutoff up here. And we'll deal with this in a minute. We're just gonna deal with the tracking right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and track. This should be reasonably quick. Let's just zoom out a bit and make sure that we can see what we're doing. So it's gonna come off the edge here. And it's probably going to go a little bit haywire when we get off the end, but then it'll be gone, so it'll be fine. So, I can't do it anymore! Yeah, that's because we can't see it, which is fine, because we can't see the screen anyway. All right. All right, so CS is asking, uh, so sometimes I go beyond and the tracker tends to drift a bit. In these cases, should I simply make it a bit tighter? So it really does depend on what you're tracking. If you've got high contrast areas behind what you're tracking and those contrast areas are a little bit more interesting to the tracker, then they're going to go for those. So if you've got a low contrast thing that you're trying to track but the background has high contrast areas, that's where you're gonna see drift. I'd also recommend when you're doing mesh tracking that you keep your roto shape for the planar track as tight as possible because mesh track is slightly more sensitive than the planar track. So the mesh track will tr immediately grab onto anything it finds interesting. Whereas the planar track has got a bit more sensitivity in terms of like, it will ignore stuff that is not contributing to the overall texture movement. So 
Yeah, so when you're working on tighter areas like this, like this could even, we could possibly even track this guy here if the screen didn't flicker or things like that because he's texture inside the plane. Like we could just go ahead and, you know, just track something like that and Mocha would be fine. But in this particular case, because we're going off screen, I'm just taking a little bit extra so that I grab the corner of that building as it goes off screen because we want to make sure that screen is, is clean. Right, so we've got our track now, but we've got this obvious problem here. I'm going to insert a clip. So we'll come over to our insert module here, sorry, insert clip, and we'll just get the insert layer. So here's what we're replacing. And we can see the big issue here. We've got this massive warp in our curved screen. And obviously down here, it's going to be here, but we can't see it at the moment. So in the insert module, we can use the grid warping tools to adjust to our curve. And this is extremely useful for things like bottles and any curved surfaces where you've got an overall planar shape to work with, but you don't have a flat shape. So I'm going to come over here to insert. And this is as simple as just going over to the grid warp. And we don't even need to turn on the grid warp in this case. But I'll turn it on anyway so we can see. So you can see the top, bottom, and corners have these little dots. If we just pull them up, you'll see this yellow shape come out. And this actually then warps the plane to the grid area. So I'm just going to line up that yellow edge with that grid. And line up with that grid. We'll just make sure it's all fitting properly. And again, we'll just use that zoom tool to make sure that we're sitting outside the edge like so and now when we scrub through we'll see that clean up nicely so the curve is now following with the planar track and warping correctly throughout the shot and this is just a very very simple example but you can you can take this to the nth degree you can curve this around a lot more and you can do the middle manipulations as well if you want to, to make it easier. And it's a very, very fast process. Again, everything we're doing here is very, very smooth and happening almost immediately because we've already tracked the information. The actual grid manipulation, the warp manipulation is you know almost real time. So it's a very, very useful way to get that warp into place. So if you want to go back and adjust the surface separately, it is recommended that you either just click the blue here or if you want to get rid of sort of everything, you can just go back to the track module and do the same thing because that will hide the extra warping. So if you want to go back and readjust without any of the warp tools in the way, you can move back to the track module to make it a bit easier. But as long as you're sitting on that blue line, you can adjust the surface. If you're sitting on the yellow line, it will adjust the outer warp of the grid. So Michael Landon asks, it's not doing uh, warp in the Z space. So, uh, yes, that is right. It's, it's purely a 2D operation, but it's doing what's called a, a cubic B-spline warp to make sure that it's matching the perspective distortion at the same time. So it's not going to happen in every situation. So there's still going to be have to be some manual manipulation going on here. So if you've got like much more gradual turns in, um, say, like a bottle or things like that, where you need to change a label, you can just keyframe this. So the perspective data will do the vast majority of the work, but then you can go ahead and keyframe this. So if I go over to grid warp, adjust the level one and adjust the grid warp handle, you can see it's making a keyframe here. So we can go ahead and do more adjustments as we go. Uh, so that's it. And then obviously we need to do the roto for the head. So I'm just going to throw on the one I did previously. So <laughs> nothing more boring than watching someone do roto. So I will <laughs> bring in this guy. So I've just rotated out his head. Let's turn off that one. And again, over in our comps, we can tell it to use all layers in the scene. Or we can tell it to use just the one we want. So in here, I want to use the head roto mask. And I'm going to turn off that one, and that one, there we go, head rotor mask. So you can see at the moment it's actually inverted, so we want to invert that, and there we go. 
So we've got the inverted mask now going over the top. And then we can go ahead and start rendering that out. And so again, the, the cutout, if we render this, so let's just go back to the beginning and render it out. You can add additional um, uh, motion blur. So motion blur will add to the overall camera motion. Motion blur is based on the tracking data though. So keep in mind if you're doing manual um, adjustments, the motion blur is based on tracking movement. So if I render this backwards, we won't see a lot of additional motion blur. That's a bit heavy. So I'm going to just um, go back and render that differently. There we go. That's a bit better. So as we're rendering this, we're again getting that cutout. But again, the cutout will be warped. Let's just turn off our uh, overlays for a second so that you can see everything in the cutout is actually warping correctly. So you've got a nice manipulated piece of data to then bring back to the host or render out to file. And I keep on talking about rendering out to file. When you're rendering to the timeline, you are rendering specifically an image cache. So when you're done rendering, so if we just render this whole thing, it should be reasonably quick. You can see we're applying anti-aliasing and making sure it all fits nicely. Let's just zoom out a bit. So it's going off screen. All right. When, wherever we want to talk about rendering to disk, we can just come up to file, go to export rendered clip, and then choose the type we want to export. We can export the composite input uh, because input is based on the input clip. So you can see down here in the bottom left, we've got background clip. It's the input that we've fed in from the host. When you're using standalone, that will actually be the file name. So if it's like, it's called just Times Square New York, the background clip will be called Times Square New York composite. So you can choose between the insert input or the composite input. <clears throat> so the insert is just the um, cutout. And then you can go ahead and render. If you haven't rendered everything, it will you can choose to revert it back to the original clip too. So if you've got blank frames, it will actually replace those frames with the original source clip. And then this is literally just a format converter. So you can convert it to an image sequence, which for whatever format you need, or you can render it out to like ProRes by choosing, <clears throat> excuse me, by choosing QuickTime. So that's the way you get out to disk. And you can do this in the plugin and in the standalone. Obviously the standalone is more important because you can't render it anywhere without rendering it to disk. But you do need to render out that timeline first so that you get the clip ready to go. So just so you're aware of that. And obviously we can choose color space as well, which is defaulted to linear because we're working in EXRs at the moment. All right, let's go back to that layer. So if we close that and save, Again, we can just come in here, render, and we get our distorted clip directly inside Nuke. So again, you're saving a lot of time by just doing as much of that work inside the Mocha insert module as possible without having to do all the post-compositing work here. Like here, I haven't done the screen yet. We could actually just do that now by adjusting it. So if I go and do, you know, multiply or darken, it will render it in here. But this is, again, what I'm talking about with... Um, screen issues is that if you do other blend modes you're just going to get the background information underneath it so generally a process for this would be you would actually paint out the background first and then do all your post composites afterwards <clears throat> excuse me so let's just go back to normal for now and so yeah i would actually take this process by yeah painting out this as just a white background or a black background and then composite on the top as two different steps. Uh, same with all of these ones. So if we were to completely replace this scene, we'd have a lot of work to do because there's so many different areas that change over time. So Times Square in general would be a nightmare to continually replace all the advertising unless you knew the compositors, sorry, the advertisers really well. So, and we've seen that before. So yes, it's very interesting to see how they change all of this information. Fixing in post, it's fun. So that's just standard screen. So the meat and bones of insert module is doing a lot of replacement for banners, screens, all that kind of fun stuff. Let's talk about 
changing organic things though. So I'm going to change over to this shot. Let's go over to this one. All right. I'm going to launch the Mookie UI for this one. So now let's talk about the fun stuff where we get into mesh manipulation. So a lot of the stuff that you want to do on organic things, especially with faces, is touch up things like doing makeup, beauty, changing the way things look in post. So in this particular shot, we've got a person having an existential crisis in the bath and we want to make their mascara run a little bit more. So what we can do here is use the insert module as normal. But the problem is she's got a face and faces are not planar. You've got some planes, you've got planes of the cheek, sides of the nose, everything can be broken down into sort of polygons. But because we're dealing with the eye area, there's a lot of different curves that fold in here. There's cheekbones, everything around here is not planar. And if you're moving around, those planes change very, very quickly. So we're going to talk about two areas here. The first we'll talk about is the eye area. So what I've done here is I've tracked her eye using the power mesh tool. So for those that aren't familiar with power mesh, that is the mesh tracking tool down here in the track tab. We can generate a uniform mesh and I recommend uniform mesh. You can use automatic but automatic is not as good for doing clean paint areas because you want to have a nice grid of starting point before you start manipulating that data. So I always recommend using the uniform generation mode so we get this nice grid of mesh. So if we look at, for example, let's just quickly draw a different one around here. All the way around here, like so. If we do an automatic, you can see it's just trying to find points. So it's found highlights in the eye. It's found those areas. We can do adaptive contrast and that'll find some more detail. There you go. So it's trying to find, you know, pores in her skin. It's trying to find the edges of her eye. And this is probably fine, but you get a lot more uniform data by using the uniform. Like, uh, surprise, surprise, uniform works really, really nicely. So let's just generate that mesh. So this is going to build on the edge of the vertex. Let's have a look at that. So you can see here, it always goes over the edge of the spine. And this is on purpose. We would do this because having an outer edge around your spine means that you get a good pinning area so that you don't get too much distortion. Because anything outside this mat will not be tracked. So this is really useful for remaining rigid on the edges of your distortion so that it doesn't sort of warp weirdly around the edges. So that's how we keep that. I'm going to go ahead and trash this one because we don't need it. Let's go back to the one I've already tracked. Because we don't want to waste time looking at that again. So tracking in Roto is very fun, but not to watch. So it's, there we go. So we've got that tracking through. We're following all the subtle curves of her skin. And it's warping into the bath here. We don't care too much about the liquid side here because we'll talk about how we can affect for that. And I've started at about here. And this is, again, a good tracking tip for anyone working with the mesh tool. Try and find the most exposed area. So everywhere else in this shot, her face is dipping below the edge here or going into the water. This point here, I've scrubbed through and found the most exposed area of her skin. So all the way down here is where all of her skin is most exposed. So CS is asking about the, uh, how is there a way to make small adjustments to the power mesh shape during the track? I know it's not advised sometimes with normal splines, but I need to make some small changes here and there. So yes, you can do that. You can do this in post or you can do this uh, as you go. So anytime you want to keep manipulating your mesh, you just come up here to the edit track mesh and you can put that back into position. So if you've tracked something a little way and you can see something drifting, you can, let's just say like, you know, this point here is drifting. You can just push it up a little bit and then keep on tracking. So you can on obviously always move things around. And a new feature in 2023 we added was the fall off tool so that you can actually change 
the size of the manipulation. So if you've got a big drift in your mesh, just use that and you can pull and push a whole area with a fall off. And this is a very, very useful for organic areas. So this just came in, uh, yeah, for 2023. It's a very, very useful tool for pulling spline points, for pulling mesh points to readjust into spots. So, and then you can also add additional mesh points. So if you're actually getting more data exposed, you can actually add more track mesh vertices over here. So we can go in here and go and add more points, pull them out, add more points, pull them out and so on. So you can continually update the mesh as you go as well. And we're going to be keep on expanding this as time goes on. We want to really sort of make sure that we get a lot of more tools for the mesh as time goes on, um, especially for future versions where we've got some exciting new stuff here coming up. Uh, I'd love to tell you what's coming, but we can't. <laughs> but the uh, there's some really, really fun stuff coming in the next versions. So we've got our track and this becomes the interesting point for insert. So insert in general has always been a surface boundary area. So if you wanted to go ahead and insert a decal or think something like that, you would bring it in and put it inside the surface area and then you would either expand your uh, surface to the edges or you would sort of bring in sort of decal kind of things. And we talked about this a little bit in the uh, Making Things Dirty cast I did a while back where, you know, you're adding sort of dirt decals all over a, a jacket to make it look more rough edged and things like that. But what we want to do here is actually just make some more mascara down her face. So what I've done is I've captured the point here. So this is frame 174. And I've just done some paint work inside Photoshop. So let's have a look at that. I'm going to go over to Photoshop here. So here's my same shot on frame 174, and I've literally just added some streaks of mascara. So I've just done some little painty bits. I've added a little bit of the way that mascara sort of pills and dots itself down the side of her face, a little bit in the corner there as well. Now, normally the way you would use this is you would bring in the clip, you would then paint it out, and then you would bring over the whole thing. So I'm gonna just grab that. We've got our mascara alpha, on a different layer and then we can save that as a TIFF file and bring it over. So if I go back to Mocha here and I'll close this. Let's go back over to Nuke. So I've already got that in here. We can see here we've got our mascara and I will open Mocha again. And that comes in as an insert layer. But keep in mind too that if you don't want to have to go outside of Mocha, you do have the option of actually just importing it. So you can go to the insert clip, import, choose the clip. Let's go to our demos. Where's that gone? There it is. We'll grab this one. We'll go to plates. And I can grab my mascara bath shot here and import that as its own clip. So that becomes a clip in here. So you can choose between, yeah, importing files or just going straight from the host. So let's go over to the insert module and see what's going on. Now you can see the obvious problem. Right now, we've got this mascara distorted to the surface plane. And that's not particularly ideal. It's got not really sitting um, in the right spot because it's being morphed and warped to the wrong spot. So what we want to do, normally, you would just go ahead and choose a line surface. So if I do this, it'll expand it out like that, but that looks wrong as well. So how do we fix this to actually make it fit? So if we expand to full frame, we're going to get the entire distortion. So the problem with doing it this way is that the surface is being distorted over the full frame, which means things like grid warp are spread across that entire frame, which is not really what we want. So instead, what we can do is, I'm just going to reset all this. Let's just go back to, we can right click here and just say reset, and that will reset the surface. Just turn on the grid warp for a second. So instead, what we can do is we can expand it to the area we want. 
So I'm going to pull that out to my mask edges. I'm just going to go just beyond the mask edges because we want to mask this later. And we can use this thing called region of interest. Now, this has been enhanced in 2023 to um, be much easier to use. Previously, you had to adjust these, these buttons and it wasn't quite getting correct. But in 2023, we've made it work much simpler. So you can just click this button called fit region of interest to the surface. And what this will do is it will clip the entire clip to the surface area. So you can see this little red dotted line around the surface. That's the region of interest area. In fact, if we look at our uh, insert layer, you can see now that this region of interest is just clipping to that area. And this is a huge deal because it means that you can now, when we go back to comp and do grid warp, all the grid warp is localized to that one image area. And this is really, really handy for making sure that it's sitting exactly in the right spot. It also means that when we turn on power mesh warp, it will warp the grid warp much more successfully. So I'm gonna turn on power mesh warp here. So power mesh warp is just literally taking, let's just turn off our grid warp. It's just literally taking our mesh and using it to drive the grid warp. So the grid warp is a Bezier spline warp, so it's getting a nice organic curving warp to our, our mesh. But the power mesh warp is driving those individual points to make sure that it fits the curve of the face correctly. And we can adjust how much it does it by the weighting. So 100% is the standard. 100% means that it's going to lock onto those Bezier warp areas and really lock it down. If you pull that back, you can reduce the effect mesh weighting has on your grid warp, which is very handy. Mesh fall off is to do with how much the mesh affects outside of the mesh area. So this means that if you've got bits of your insert sitting out here, how much the mesh will affect this is based on the mesh fall off. And if you don't want it to affect anything outside the mesh, you just set that to zero, which makes it much, much cleaner. So what we're going to do now is, yeah, just show how this works. So I'm going to turn off my grid. So now if we go back to the start and play this back, which it looks like I have an animation key somewhere. Just going to double check where that went. Get rid of those. As I was prepping this, it looks like I added an animation key by default. So now, yeah, so let's just turn off the grid warp. We can see that now the mesh warp is going to pull and turn that mascara correctly in space so that, so that it looks correct. So it's no longer a planar distortion, it's actually a mesh distortion. And you can see the effect of it here in the insert module. You can control how much of this happens. So if I come back quite far here, we can see that as the water affects the mesh slightly, we're getting a little bit too much distortion over here. So then that's when we can adjust the mesh weighting. And you can see how that yellow line is pulling back to the surface. This means that we're getting less distortion on the mesh weighting and just relying on the planar track now. So the more we ramp this up, the more you see the power mesh affecting our warp. So it's a very, very handy way to just tell by the manipulation how much that warp is being affected. So let's have a look at another example to see how this will be easy. And I'm going to just do this from scratch. So we've got, yeah, well, we've got about 10 minutes left. So let's tr look at this one. So I've tracked the lips here. And I'll just go ahead and show the mesh for that. So this will be a much more extreme example. You can see here we've got her lips are actually pouting and moving around as she's uh, having her crisis in the bath. So we can want to go ahead and make a few more sort of sort of lip cracks and things like that in her lips. So I'm going to go back over to Photoshop and we'll turn back on this. Let's just create a new layer. And I'm just going to quickly paint some in here. So let's just find the general texture of her lips. And let's just darken that down a bit. And we'll just add some additional kind of little bit of cracky bits in here. 
This is not going to be uh, perfect because we're doing it quick. Let's just add a little bit in there, just following the general curves. Grab some. So we're just painting in a few more additional lines. We'll soften that out a little bit. Just like so, get that highlight, pop that through there. So just adding a little bit more in there. Because with things like skin, you, you want the subtlety. You don't want too much additional punch. There we go, that's not too bad. This is not going to be a masterpiece by any means because we're short on time. Yeah, so uh, Michael asks, oh, am I basing the paint on one frame of the shot? Yes, and again, the, the way we try to do this is, and you can do this over multiple frames if you need to, but generally what we try and find for these kind of shots is the most, again, the most exposed frame. So this is frame 174 uh, from the, the shot, and this is where her eyes and her lips were turned most of the camera and we were seeing most of the data. If bits, new bits are revealed, you would have to kind of do this in stages. You would want to um, make sure that you have different shots that blend into each other to actually make it. Like this is a sort of a straightforward shot because we, you know, we, we want to keep things simple for the demo. But when you're working on more exposed shots, let's have a look at that. Yeah, that's not too bad. We've got some more crack in there now. When you're working on sort of shots where things go all over the place, you will have, you'd have to build it up over different shots over different uh, frames. So um, I'm just going to turn that off. We've got, you know, our lip pattern here now. And we'll just save that. Now on my computer, Adobe, I don't want it somewhere else. There we go. I'll save that. So let's go back over to the Mercury plugin. So I'm just going to close and save and just make sure that that has been um, refreshed here in nope not yet let's just reload our read on this one. Oh, and i've accidentally saved transparency one sec let's try that again save transparency please thank you all right we'll reload that again there we go. All right. So let's go back over to Mocha. All right. So we're going to use exactly the same insert module here. So I'm going to grab the lips. Let's go back over to insert and we'll use exactly the same clip. And again, this is really, really useful for this. So we're going to find, I've started my track here. I'm just going to expand my surface. So again, you can see that alpha coming in, but it's not in the right spot. So Visual Elements says, uh, personally, I prefer to fit the surface at the top instead of having to click on more tabs for the region of interest. And in some cases, I agree with that, the Visual Elements, but in when you're working on smaller areas of distortion, so if we look at this, I'm going to expand this fully. This will fit, which is great, but the problem is, is that when you start to do manipulations on that, it's going to be distorting the entire frame. And it also means that if you want to do additional paintwork, so here you can see I've done one frame for the mascara and one frame for the lips, these two things move in entirely different ways. So being able to crop to the region of interest means that I can use the same insert over and over again on the same frame, but use it in different places without having to mask. So there's lots of different ways to be able to manipulate this. So if I just undo that, so I can go ahead and now fit surface to ROI. And now it's just being used for this area. So again, if we look over here at the insert layer, I'm now just cropping for this layer on this one. And it means that I can actually render this perfectly for this area. 
So I can go ahead and like, it's obviously a bit extreme on this thing. So I can just blend that down a bit. We can do some, some multiplication. Let's maybe do Caliburn and then we'll reduce it down the opacity. There we go. A little bit of gain on that. And now we're manipulating from the source. So I've got to come down here to mesh warp, make sure that's on. And then that overall work here is going to be manipulating correctly with the power mesh. You can see it warping with her lips correctly as she purses her lips here. And we can see that mesh distortion starting to pull in the surface. So as we come in tight here, you can see some severe distortion happening where the mesh is pulling in. If we look at that mesh, we can see how it's cromping in the middle of it. But we're not getting any over distortion. It's actually fitting correctly to the insert. And this is a much, much faster way of doing the mesh warp than using the stabilized method of actually using mesh warp here. So painting a frame, unwarping it, and then rewarping it. It's much, much faster to just do the direct manipulation straight on the insert module. So we're pretty much out of time. I'm just going to double check the chat and see if there's any other questions. No, we look all good. So we might wrap it up there, but I'll just talk very, very quickly again. So the mesh warp inside the power mesh for insert is probably my favorite feature at the moment inside Mocha. It's just really, really handy to be able to do all of this distortion directly inside here. Now, there are other ways you can do this, obviously. You could go to the track module and you could export track and export Alembic out to Fusion or Nuke, and that will give you the actual mesh data to do these kind of manipulations. But mesh doesn't have the Bezier warp capability of the insert module. That gives you a much more organic flow to the insert here. So like, if I wasn't happy with the way these strokes were fitting, you could actually just go ahead and grab the grid warp here. Let's go down to level two maybe, and just readjust on top of that mesh warp. So you've got a mesh warp on top of a grid warp on top of a surface warp. You've got so many different ways to manipulate the data without having to take it back anywhere while you're actually rendering. So it's a very, very handy way to just quickly adjust. There we go, a little bit of adjustment here, a little bit of adjustment there. And then that all is being rewarped again by the mesh warp. So it's a very, very powerful way to work when you're doing compositing work, even if you're just using it as a pre-visualization tool before you do your final composite back in your compositor. All right. So that's our time today on the insert module. I hope that was useful for everyone. If you've got any questions, again, just ask them in the comments. We will uh, try and follow up where we can. And obviously, again, please do request features uh, for the office hours. We're always interested to hear what people want us to talk about, what you want us to deep dive into so that you get more value out of Mocha Pro. So thanks very much for your time today, and we'll all see you again soon. See you later. Mm -hmm.